amigos, bienvenidos a una nueva edición de En Vinil, yo soy Ricardo Méndez y hoy estoy muy contento porque estamos dentro del DCC Museum que se encuentra en Los Ángeles, California y no se la van a acabar con toda la explicación que tenemos aquí, así que no se despeguen de este En Vinil tan especial en el DCC Museum. Bueno amigos, como se los prometí, estamos en el DCC Museum y en estos momentos me acompaña Ralph. Hi, Hello, Ralph. hi. So, uh, let's jump into things. How does this dream start? I mean, you are probably the only, uh, the only museum for a, for, for, for a dead format that is sort of a coming back, but I mean, uh, but, it, but it still is just having more uh, attention right now. So, how do you start the museum? Just Yeah, the museum actually started uh, about four years ago when I saw um, a video uh, from Tecmon and uh, he was talking about Alcacet and DCC and at that point I was, you know, having a little bit of midlife crisis with audio. Okay. I wanted to have a different format and uh, now living in the United States, it, uh, I realized that I had always missed out on, uh, on DCC. So I bought two players in, uh, in Europe and they were sold to me as, uh, as working. Mm -hmm. By the time they got here, none of them worked. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a little bit uh, messed up with. And then um, because I have an electronics background, I, um, I dusted off the old soldering iron and I, uh, I fixed them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put one for use and the other one I put on eBay and uh, it sold really quickly. And I thought like, wow, there must be a lot of people interested in, in, this, uh, in this format. Why would this sell within a day? So I started investigating and um, found out that there was a vibrant community, but there was so much misconception. Even the Wikipedia pages had all the wrong information. So I decided, okay, um, let's do this right. So I bought another player and another player, and then I got help from people. And then um, I got contacted two years later by uh, Jeremy Hayden. And uh, he said, I have this uh, dream that on my 20th anniversary as an artist, I want to release my new album on every format possible. So he did uh, CD download, uh, vinyl, reel-to-reel, -reel, a track, DAT, mini disc, and he wanted to do DCC, but nobody could do okay. DCC anymore. So he asked me, uh, "Can you figure this out?" So um, the modification, which uh, I, I will I will show you guys later, we figured that out on how to officially record. Um, a title like it was in the 90s with the bar because Jeremy has a studio and um, he is able to uh, license with barcode so it's officially registered on Discogs. So once we did that we sent that tape back to, 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 to Tecmon. I'd never talked to him before it's like you know because of you we started mm -hmm. this format and here is a tape and then he did an article on the on the Jeremy Hayden tape and then uh, it skyrocketed. I would st at that point still had maybe uh, 10 players or so. But then people from over the world started sending me donations, players, tapes. And I thought like, wait a second, I cannot, you know, put these on eBay or keep them myself. I mean, these are donations. So then the idea of making it official and becoming the official DCC museum, because it didn't exist. At that point, I, I talked to Philips. They, they, they didn't have a museum about anything, vinyl, cassette, or DCC. And, um, and then I also found out that there were uh, only, 42, only 42 players. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so this is basically built within four or five years, the whole museum from zero to where it is today. So let's talk about history on the, on the music, on the formats. I mean, um, technology has come uh, a, a long way uh, in a very short time. I mean, we used to have just you know, shellac records, the vinyl, uh, the compact cassette, which uh, take a lot, uh, a lot in, in you know take take off and, mm -hmm. and mostly out of the Walkman. And, and the video side, uh, things happen the same. I mean, uh, once Beta VHS uh, fight uh, uh, ended, I mean, we got VHS like 20 years uh, as, as a format. I mean, laser, laser disc didn't have that much, but uh, in the audio business, I mean. After the the, the the release of our city, I mean, they, they came one and another and another. I mean, of course, it was the first the DAT, and then the, this um, race against uh, against time, uh, unless they didn't knew, which was um, Minidisc and DCC. I mean, uh, and and then well, 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 I mean, we have MP3s and stuff. I mean, but but the 
the the the history behind DCC. I mean, I mean, you know all about that. I mean, mm -hmm. I just can reproduce whatever I, I can find on Wikipedia. But please guide us through the, okay. that, that story. Well, at, at the um, about 87, 86, 87, 88, in that time period, the um, the music um, producers, consumer electronics all over the world, sort of had the idea that DAT was going to be the next best thing. It had perfect music, you could copy and have a perfect copy without hearing the difference, and it was um, relatively easy to produce because it was magnetic tape. Mm -hmm. But the musical industry uh, rejected it because they had uh, a little um, uh, disgrunt or still bad feelings with Philips, because when Philips came out with the cassette in 60, allowing everybody to make a mixtape. They didn't want that on the best quality ever. At least the, the cassette and the mixtape was sort of like, mm. you know, the quality was so-so, but DAT was great. Yeah. So the music industry had two problems. They didn't make any money at that point and they didn't want DAT. So they rejected. Uh, that's why you can find almost any DATs produced with an official artist on it because the, the, all the music industry did say, okay, we're not gonna do it. You can build the equipment, we're not going to produce the tapes. So at that point in 88, um, Philips thought of two things. Okay, what if we compress it and we make it like a normal cassette so you can play your regular cassette and the DCC and we put the copy protection on it so that you can only make one copy and not endless copies um, of, of a tape. And uh, they wrote a business plan. Uh, they developed the, the, the DCC and the music industry said yes to DCC because that uh, they could see happen. They, uh, they didn't have to uh, change the store inventory because the DCC tape has the same size. You can put it in the same shelving and stuff like that. And uh, so the problem was um, that from concept of building the DCC to releasing, it just took too long. But that time, uh, you know, you already almost had the internet and recordable CDs, but that's a true story why DCC, uh, DCC only got developed, including Minidisc. Those two formats only exist because the music industry rejected DAT. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I mean, it's some, some, somehow ironic that they rejected DAT because at the end, pretty much all the master tapes that went into producing uh, CDs were, were recorded always, on DAT. Were always on DAT. So, I yeah. mean, that, 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 that was like uh, ironic. But also, I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the industry um, was uh, so scared of, of these multiple copies and what happened? I mean, back in the, in, in the, in the early 2000s, we got Napster, we got this MP3 and whoa, the worst nightmare came true. So, uh, well, but they, of course they didn't know that and, and they were not all great visionaries that, that they, I mean, if they would have known what would happen in 94 with the, with the internet, I mean the first time I saw the internet in 1994, it didn't click with me either that this could be the greatest download for audio and video ever, which it is today. Look at YouTube, it only be, exists because we have yeah. such fantastic internet. I mean, I mean, I could never foreseen it either way. I mean, mm -hmm. You, you, I mean, I mean, you, you try to download one uh, text page and it takes hours. So I mean, but but this is what I was saying. I mean, uh, technology has come a long way in a very short time. I mean, '94 is the beginning of the internet. By 1999, you already have uh, some word, uh, some sort of a streaming with uh, Windows Media and. And well, now it's in, it's unimaginable. It's unimaginable. But what we have, we have a speeds like two hundred megabytes per second. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, <laughs> we we just to uh, to to get online with a twenty eight kilobytes uh, modem. So modem, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on the phone. So motivation, motivation. But um, let's talk about. I mean, two music lovers. We love music. We love our formats. That's why pretty much everything of this exists. Um, what is your take on the DCC sound? I mean, I mean, you have um, pretty much every way to compare. You have reel to reel. You have turntable. You have CD players over there. You have DATs. You have mm -hmm. uh, Minidisc. But the DCC. I mean, what's your take on that sound? Why is that? Uh, so uh, um, I don't know why. Why you like the sound of the DCC? 
Well, I like the sound of the D. It's not the most practical format because you still have tape, you still need to wind. So yeah. that's why mini disc, you know, was more, uh, even though the sound quality was worse, it was a lot, uh, it was a sexier sell. You know, you could skip, yeah. you had this new format, it, it, it looked different. Um, why DCC now sounds better is because, you know, they, uh, the compression is so neatly and well done with the, um, the masking of the audio. You have uh, multiple frequencies that's coming to your ear and the scientists will figure out, it's like, okay, if you're listening to that frequency, you sure as heck fire cannot hear those three, so we can take those out. And they had, uh, the way that was developed, I mean, if you look in, in hindsight, it was, it was brilliant because they had a group of people that were all uh, audio fanat uh, fanatics back then, mm -hmm. and they called them the group with the golden ears. Okay. And they, uh, it took them a year that they were playing DCC, CD, and, and, and DAT tracks until they could not hear the difference blindsided, like, okay, are we listening now to, D to DCC or are we listening to DAT? They couldn't hear the difference. And then they knew they had a winner. With CD, um, a lot of people can't hear the difference between CD and DCC, but that's, to be honest, because you're listening to the wrong music. If yeah. you're gonna truly develop a, or a, a hearing for music, the only true way is if you're going to do some Pink Floyd or most likely classical music. I'm a big 80s geek. None of the yeah. 80s music will get you a good quality difference between CD mm. and, and, uh, and DCC, at least no. most of it. But on classical, with, uh, with, uh, especially with piano, where um, the number of DC bells are important, this is where DCC shines because it can do, uh, this, this machine here can do up to 105 decibels. That is okay. beyond the reach of CD. But to get to those 105 decibels, you gotta listen to, listen to, the, to, the, to the right music. Compared to other formats like, like for instance, an Otari, I'm 51, so I'm a little bit older than you. When I was <laughs> growing up, this was all we had. Okay. And people always call it the warmth of the sound. What you're basically telling me is basically uh, missing the high frequency. That's the warmth yeah. of the sound. So the reason why all of this becomes popular, in my opinion, is, is two reasons. You have the people that are somewhere between uh, 40 and 65, which didn't have the money mm -hmm. back then and do have a little bit of money now that can spend it. Mm -hmm. And then you have what I call the reverse innovation. Okay. After the 90s, after the CD really came out, it stopped with the format. You and I grew up in an era where every two, three years, they came up with something new. Yeah. Now the audio compression, whether it's FLAC or MP3, it gets better. But the very first time my 16-year-old daughter saw a DCC tape, she thought it was an innovation. She thought it was something new. And there you go. So. For the, that's the reason why uh, kids are looking at DCC and buying vinyl, mm -hmm. because they never had the experience of going through the cover book. You don't own anything if you're listening to a streaming music. You don't get to see the pictures of the artists and, and browse through it, and it's, a, it's an experience. So now the kids um, um, buy albums without having a turntable. I went two years ago to the Making Vinyl Conference in Detroit mm -hmm. and 15% of people under 25 buying vinyl do not have a turntable. That was mind blowing to me. Why would you have a vinyl collection if you do, because a Crossley turntable is $49. Yeah. No, they wanna look at it, they hang it, they open it. It's like reading a book. So uh, it proves that music is just more than listening. Music is lyrics, music is, is uh, uh, is, is sound, music is, is falling in love, and this music can also be looking at the, uh, at the cover. Yeah, you can Which it. none of those, which you can really do, uh, other than listening to it when you stream. Yeah. You do, the pro, the, the, uh, I interviewed the, uh, Jan Timmer, the CEO of Philips, regarding this project, and he called it the pride of ownership. Kids never had that because they stream, and what's on your phone you don't really own. Yeah. You buy a nice piece of equipment, or you buy a, a, a piece of vinyl, or you have a DCC, you know, you uh, you can open it. You can you yeah. can suddenly touch it. Or, or even a, a regular cassette, a compact yeah. cassette. I mean, you you had this uh, little booklet that you can um, uh, unfold to to get the lyrics at least or, or, yeah. or something. And this happened. I mean, it, it's something very important that most uh, uh, of, of people does not uh, take on. Um, 
take importance of, which is the so-called uh, loudness war. Mm -hmm. But this came right uh, before, r r exactly right before that. I mean, the first CDs sounds great, but the newest versions of even first releases now with this loudness thing, it sounds terrible. And and I found that uh, this is like, um, let's compare it with something like the Flack record. I mean, mm -hmm. I. I, I even though it's compressed music, I just can't uh, can tell that this is music compressed. I mean, mm -hmm. I do uh, sound it like very rich and, mm -hmm. and powerful. So, what do you think about the? I mean, if the 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 format would would um, take on uh, take on, um, how would it be the sound with this loudness? Uh, Extra they put on. They might have uh, they might have suffered from the same problem because the the, the, the loudness is not really something that uh, the format has any judgment on. I found out later that it's usually the mastering engineered, pushed by their bosses, make it loud, loud, loud because yeah. it has to play in the mall and you have to hear, you know, you, you cannot do the bass but you have to do the mid and the high tone section. So the loudness wars is, is mostly is mostly commercial. So I, if Minidisc and DCC would have survived, I think they would have been part of the Loudness Wars as, uh, as, as well, I think. But that's, you, you, don't, you never know, but it would seem logic that they would have the same problem. Like I said, I have a, the, the earlier CDs sound way better than, than what I'm buying right now. Sometimes it's horrible. You have talked with uh, people of uh, Philips, which designed the project, and I know there were uh, a lot of uh, other brands on it. I mean, you can see Morantz over there, uh, JVC Picture, Techniques, which is the uh, Panasonic uh, uh, brand also. Mm -hmm. And, well, I mean, I, every new technology has this uh, starting point price, and it's most of the time first adopters have to pay a lot of money, but. Uh, DCC has four generations players, and Correct. the price never, never actually came down. So, um, have you like uh, speak with them about this? I mean, why don't try to make it? I don't know something even more affordable for people to to engage on the sound or mm -hmm. whatever. I did, I did, and the uh, there is um, uh, the answer is uh, is a little bit longer. I know my my, my answers are a little bit longer. Uh, um, that was the intention. The intention was to get the price down as quickly as possible because the, the early adopters had to pay a fortune. I, um, the introduction DCC player cost for me uh, the same as a month salary back then. It was about $1,200. So that's what I was making in 1992. I couldn't afford one unless I really, really wanted one. So from the get-go, this was not for, for an average Joe, which was a problem. But if you look at their uh, documents, they had intentions within three, four years to lower the price to less than half, 40%. Uh, they, they said, okay, we need to sell a million players a year and then we can produce, produce, produce. And by that time, you know, if you have more players sold, then we can lower the price because there were two things that were very expensive. That was the new hat, the thin film hat and the mechanism itself. Okay. So they anticipated that they would outsource the entire mechanism. Mm -hmm. At first Mat Matsushita, uh, the Panasonic and JVC and, mm -hmm. and Techniques brand made the mechanisms. And what happened, because like I said, they were two years late to the, to the party, um, they thought that cassette, the analog uh, audio cassette would eventually die. And it didn't. And why it didn't die was because all the manufacturers that produced cassette tapes, they stopped. And it went to two plants worldwide in China that produced, I think it was in China, they produced all the mechanisms and the mechanisms became very, very cheap. Okay. So analog cassette became very cheap mm -hmm. and uh, none of these two plants wanted to produce DCC because DCC was very complicated. They yeah. needed a different head. So Philips had to keep um, building their own mechanism and instead of the price going down, it and went down. up. And they, uh, they, they blew it on, on that marketing thing. That was the real reason why they couldn't lower the prices. They wanted to, and it would have for sure helped, uh, helped the case. I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's why we have like, I mean, this is the, the this is C900, the first one, right? Mm -hmm. But also the techniques. I mean, uh, can we open this? Yes, sure. I mean, you can see this one and this one are pretty much the same. I mean, it's another brand, or, or I mean, it just uh, this is Philips, and here's Techniques, but it's the same thing. So, um, 
That uh, I, I don't know how consumer take that, but I mean, if I'm buying a Phillips and I'm a, a, a hardcore fan of the of the brand, I don't want that Technics has the same, right? So I don't know. Maybe that uh, also get contribute. I don't know. Uh, I I agree with you, and and um, uh, as a matter of fact, so if you look at the first generation that came out, you have um, a couple of players, which is these three, the Marans. The Panasonic, which looks a lot like the Technics, but has the side panels. The 900, the Technics, and here the Optimus 2000 with the side door. Everything inside is 99% the same. <laughs> and I agree with you, if, if you have to make it uh, uh, look different, you can. Because why do those two look uh, so similar is beyond me, because even Optimus chose to go for the video style, which was very popular in the 90s, you know, with the door and stuff like that. And this player is, like I said, is, is almost identical like the Marans, yet this is called the Holy Grail because it has a different DA converter. Okay. But the, the mechanism, the head, everything is the same. Yet uh, this goes for three times the money as this one. This is the least desirable, most desirable. So looks, uh, I agree with you, uh, should be different because there is a little, a uh, little bit for everyone. I mean, if you buy this one, this is such a specific gray, it really doesn't go with anything other than that Philips color it be because it belonged to that Philips set. Yeah. So this is um, identical unit. This is t at least uh, uh, 30, 40 percent more in value and highly desirable because there is more of a techniques fan base then there is a Philips for, for this type of equipment. So it's, uh, it's weird. But um, the good news is that, that regarding spare parts and, and repairs, um, you can mix and match. If, you, if you're looking for components, they're easy to find because all these players have the same bones. So that's, that makes restoration and preservation uh, a little bit easier. Estén muy pendientes. Habrá un documental. It's going to be a documentary on mm -hmm. DCC. Uh, they're producing it. Uh, when, and there's uh, the people in Phillips uh, who designed the, the, mm -hmm. the foreman. Van a estar los diseñadores. Está Tecmo as well. Yeah. También está Tecmo, que fue el que le dio la vida a esto. Y el 27, 27, June, June 27, right? 22nd. Yeah. 20, 22 de junio va a estar disponible. Where it's going to be a bell, man. You can see YouTube it's, uh, or... It's going to be on YouTube, yes. Habrá un documental, ya seguramente ya lo podrán ver este, cuando estén acá, pero muy pendientes de eso y bueno, ya nos platicarán la, la idea. So, now, let's get a, a walkthrough on this. Uh, I mean, everything is connected, right? I mean, we can uh, hear whatever we want if we, if we, if we Yes, uh, basically, uh, except for the portables, which use a battery, but all these players uh, here are physically uh, connected through, uh, through a switch. Okay, so guide so us through the whole uh, museum, because this is... Uh, the core of the museum. I mean, this is the collection. Yeah, one of the the, the most special thing it starts with the, with this. This is the the very first uh, prototype, the 850. Um, everything is hand built inside of, uh, of, of of this. This was the very first uh, DCC player that um, Philips did their uh, did their testing on. There are only three or four units of these uh, of these left, and. Um, this is unique because uh, I believe there is only two of them of those four are working. This is a working uh, working model, and that uh, turned into the uh, the first generation, which you have here, the 900, the Technics RSDC10, the Optimus 2000, and then over here the Morans 92, 82, and the Panasonic version of the RSDC10, which is a little wider with the uh, with the, the side panels. So that was the the, the first generation. Now, uh, since last week, uh, I also um, was in contact with, uh, we're not only in contact with the designer and the inventors of this, uh, since last week, I'm able to talk to the um, designer of the CD jewel case, the mm -hmm. box that opened, okay. and he also designed the, um, the DCC tape. Many awards because it, it, uh, when they went from analog to this, they knew it had to be sexy and it had to be different. So they wanted a one hand operation. So when they had car players, like, like over here, when you were sitting in the car, nobody knew why this was portrait. I didn't know until last week. So with one hand, you could slide it out like this, put it in your car player without, without taking the hand off the wheel. Okay, you can. So you go like this. 
So and then and that's also sadly but true a little bit Philips. They it's like okay if this is the logic for the tape and the car stereo, why, why don't do we, we do this? Why do do we ha still have a uh, the eject a, 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 a portrait mode where we somehow now have to find this 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 doesn't work very well. So the second generation that you brought me, they suddenly have all of this. You see where uh, the second generation has a portrait mode and I never knew why the second generation has it. That's, that's to create the consistency. So you could do with one hand, you could do, um, you could do uh, an insert. Okay. That's the whole reason why. And then people didn't like it very much. So by the next generation, they abandoned it again and they went back to uh, another trace system, which is, uh, which is this generation. The quality um, of the build per se didn't get much better. I mean, they had to uh, make it cheaper and cheaper. This was um, all built in Europe and Japan. Those, the second generation was mostly built in uh, Belgium and this is built in Singapore. Um, quality went up. These were 16-bit players, first and second generation. And then by the time the third generation came around, which is the, uh, the 730 and the, uh, the 951, those were already 18 bit. Okay. So, and that gave you, you know, more than a hundred decibels. So especially for uh, the classical music fans, which never abandoned DCC, a true classical lover would listen to two things, vinyl and DCC. Okay. Vinyl to have the true warmth and full uncompressed mm -hmm. uh, experience. A, a true classical lover doesn't do streaming or flag or no, whatever. No, 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 no. But they, they don't like any other format either. So maybe they would DAT, but they, you can only have a DAT if you uh, record, you record one. one. Yes. But um, uh, Philips was, of course, the king of classical music because Polygram uh, owned uh, almost anything on classical music. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot of releases. But the classical music market uh, is, of course, very much different than the pop music market. So they, they somehow had a little bit of an identity crisis. So this was absolutely championed by classical music lovers. But by that time, you know, most people had abandoned the idea, younger people, and they just went on with, uh, with, with, with something else. Um, without Philip, Philips even knowing, because at that point uh, they didn't have a war with Matsushita, because uh, DCC is a collaboration between Philips and Matsusta, which basically is the Technics brand. So Philips thought that this was the last player. No, in, in Japan, they went on to have a fourth generation, which is the, uh, the Techniques. Um, I think this is a beautiful machine because it has a, a, a finally a, a normal door. You know, it is, it's electronic. Uh, unfortunately, it's still not glass. And also a very nice, um, uh, very nice display, and they uh, they have a black version, which is only uh, Japan. So um, uh, so it went on a little longer. This was available even in in, in 1996, and then um, the very last uh, player ever built was the um, the Victor. That's uh, that's this one. Looks a lot like the uh, the Techniques. Uh, the difference is that in high-end audio, this is the best player you can possibly get because this is a 20, this is the only 20-bit player out there. So you went from 16 to 18 to 20-bit um, uh, players. So how does how does affect or, or or you perceive? I mean, tapes were recorded the same. So yeah. if you play on a 16 or an 18 or a 20, um, what 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 does that to the music? I mean, what can you hear? Or or what, how, what's the difference? What, what, what can you uh, get on, on this with the same tapes? Well, with the same tapes, um, I must say that as a 51 year old, I have a tough time hearing the difference between 16 and 18 bit and, and uh, only very young people would be theoretically go uh, beyond 18 bit. So I think then other than the entire spectrum, I feel it's more, mostly commercial. Because uh, I don't know how your hearing is, but you know it's it's a uh, child of twelve has okay. ide ideal right. hearing, and then it goes it goes really okay. quickly. Um, if you ask me if I could honestly hear the difference between eighteen and twenty bit, I cannot. I cannot hear I hear the difference. But you know, um, like with anything, um, uh, there is a commercial purpose. Uh, you know, DAT will 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 do much more, and still people 
you know want the best uh, yeah. the best experience possible so um, uh, for the true collector that's the most sought after but very few people are willing to cough uh, that, uh, to, to make that much money available because you can have uh, a DCC player you know reasonably starting at two three hundred dollars and, and this could go up to three four thousand to get one of these <laughs> so it's uh, uh, because they're they're, they're not re uh, really available and and all of these players need work they didn't stand time uh, well uh, meaning that that um, every generation uh, has his different quirks and for we have specialized and you know in getting the, the the belts and the parts the pinch rollers are easy but all of them have uh, either a gear problem, a leaking capacitor problem, all which requires some form of specialistic work to, to, to keep it going. Now, these are the high-end audio versions, but uh, there was also like a, a more popular version. I mean, the portables, that was a mm -hmm. boombox over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was like a, this mini component uh, thing, right, mm -hmm. as well. The, the 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 MIDI systems were actually the, um, the, the 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 cheaper versions. Uh, we have those over here. Closing these windows. So these sets were actually reasonably inexpensive, and um, this, for instance, uh, was one of the cheapest uh, Philips made, an FW68, and it's the only model that they ever uh, that they ever made that has a regular cassette mechanism and a DCC mechanism so with that you could copy from CD to DCC from tape to DCC or from DCC to tape and then other follows that that's a more a little bit more high-end but these are all uh, uh, techniques Philips a little bit cheaper in the 90s everything had to suddenly become smaller yeah it's a time when when Bose made their you know famous uh, milk carton speakers yeah. because the wife didn't want to see these big speakers anymore um, it was it was it was, uh, it was commercially appropriate to to make everything uh, small. It didn't mean it, it necessarily went, uh, got better, unfortunately. So you said it was forty two players, well, mm -hmm. made. Yes. and you have here thirty nine of them. Yes, yes. Actually, um, um, as of uh, that is corrected because as of last week we found um, something uh, new, which is uh, 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 very unique. We found player number 43 now you have to understand if you uh, I call myself you know the, 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 the curating part of this museum I, I curate this this collection so if you have been told and everything is documented for 27 years that only 42 players exist and you find number 43 I, I couldn't sleep for two days I'll tell you that uh, yeah and it was because somebody in the Czech Republic um, told me that he had this and I did of course I a red flag was up you you get a lot of people telling you stuff that is maybe not the entire truth but when he sent me the pictures and the um, and the video uh, I was so excited and then you end up with two people two kind of people people who want uh, a fortune yeah. or people that are really interested in preserving history and they made uh, he made a very uh, reasonable offer and sent it to me and uh, it required little work, but uh, yeah, this is player number 43. And out of the 43, we have 39 here actively okay. uh, actively working. Um, the portable section is also um, very special. Uh, this one is uh, signed by the inventor, Bram Hogendorn. He, he's the inventor of the compression format uh, of the DCC, mm -hmm. uh, PASC. Um, First generation that came out, Philips built their very first portable uh, like this. Mm -hmm. Panasonic, I must say, outdid them because it, it, they at least did a model with a glass door. So if you were playing the tape, you could at least see the artwork. Okay. All of the Victor and the Philips mm -hmm. one were closed. And then uh, by the time they did the next generation, they hadn't learned much because still, you know, they looked sexier, much sexier uh, than than uh, than these but all the doors are still closed. So what we also do uh, at the museum is um, with uh, materials that are not working, okay. we, uh, we have some mechanical skills. So this, for instance, is a player uh, that we call what, uh, what could have been. Okay. So on the, on the front end, it's, it's the same like, uh, like a regular player, mm -hmm. but on the back end, it actually oh. has the glass door. We think they should have built it like this, 
complete see-through so that if you would um, that if you would pop in a tape you see now suddenly you see the you, you, you could, you, which was the striking difference and yeah. the buttons are now on the on the other side so it's a little thicker and um, uh, but of course this doesn't exist and we um, uh, we did a few more. We did one when uh, when uh, DCC uh, turned 25. We made a gold model and we made an <laughs> orange model for the uh, for the Dutch heritage. Yeah, and they um, they did a really uh, really swell design again by by putting all the artwork in here. It is um, all the information that you used to have on vinyl. It's more detailed than than it was ever on on uh, on analog cassette. But it's made for young people because it's really small. <laughs> it is really small. Yeah. You have on these uh, wood panels the tapes. Of yes. Most of them, mm -hmm. right? So you have uh, including a, a collection of um, on brand new tapes. Yeah. Here we have the. Uh, this is all the uh, the, okay. the, the portables we have. Uh, every portable made in in box. This is new. And um, uh, one thing special is this one. We got that uh, two months ago. This is uh, one of our pride and joys. This belongs or belonged to the drummer of Paul Simon. All right. And uh, he contacted us. He said, uh, "I got a DCC. It needs to be uh, restored." So I restored it from from him. And um, uh, the interested uh, two things were immediately interesting. That's the packaging because you can see it's smaller. Mm -hmm. Because it was only for in-flight sales. Only the airline oh, okay. would sell this. So and then he called me and then he said um, I am uh, uh, I'm coming to LA to pick it up. It's like uh, you're coming to LA uh, just for the DCC? No, he said I have a recording session. It's like uh, where are you going to record? He said at Capitol Records. So then I immediately you know begged him. It's like why don't I visit you? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a fun night. I went uh, to Capitol Records. I saw him uh, drum on a, on his his uh, next records and. Um, when he found out how special this was for us, he said, uh, you can have it. <laughs> so he, uh, a bit, uh, about 30% of what you see here is, is, is donated okay. by people. And uh, so, so you, like I said, you have two types of collectors, the collectors who uh, collect for the money, or you have collectors who uh, understand that there is a, a bigger meaning of preserving. And uh, therefore, just like you, it is my task because not everybody can come to Los Angeles to make sure that out of every single one of these players, you basically make two YouTube videos, how to repair them and how they operate. Okay. And I'm about halfway through. So it'll take me uh, <laughs> another two, three years to, to get it done. But I, I try to do um, every two weeks um, a video either on how things operate, uh, a video about how I met the drummer of Paul okay. Simon, and sometimes just a simple video about how you uh, how, how things work. So uh, there are things quite important that uh, we must say. Uh, how to preserve this museum? You have a patron, so why don't you uh, uh, tell us about the patron uh, page? And well, if people wants to come to see the museum, what they can, what 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 they have to do, uh, please. Yeah. Well, that, that gives me a little bit chance to advertise for this uh, museum. So what we nice. what we do is um, when we start at the museum we try to keep the format alive. That is our slogan. So every help, every email, whatever we can do to help uh, another collector, we do that absolutely for free. But to make sure that this closet and that we have the spare parts and that we, uh, that we can keep going, that we have a web page, etc., etc., it is all run by, um, by, by volunteers and uh, the costs are done by donators of equipment and we do have a Patreon channel where uh, people donate and uh, we started that about uh, uh, two years ago and with that uh, money we are able to uh, either buy cassettes, produce music, uh, restore players or uh, make sure the website is, uh, is, is, is running. Yeah, thanks. So, and if people want to come to see the museum, you have to write to you? They, uh, they, like you did, I mean, the, uh, the, the museum is, is basically open by appointment, but um, that means it, it could be seven days a week. And uh, it's free. Uh, every, uh, everyone can come and see it uh, for free and, and, we'll get, uh, and we'll get the tour. Yeah. yeah. You, you wanted to see the tape still? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, <laughs> because yes. I, I cut you short. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so you said uh, about uh, 500... Uh, uh, different tapes. Yeah, this is, this is, prácticamente mucho del catálogo. Hay cosas bien interesantes. 
I, I, there's interesting like we have Bobby Brown over here, Paddy Austin, Boys to Men, Aha. This is a, a, a quite a difficult tape. Uh, Ava. Well, there's a lot, and you have the 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 blank tapes, right? The mm -hmm. Yeah, the blank tapes. Casi cada uno de los formatos, estos son Philips, Philips, casi todos tienen cinta BASF, menos uh, estos que son Fuji, eh, los Fuji, los Axia y los um, Victor, los JVC Victor, ¿no? son, son de otro marco, ¿no? estos son all brands, right? Yes, all yes. the brands that, uh, that, that produced on it. Ok, well, uh, bueno, este, esta visita eh, de Juegos Juegos Colecciones al Museo no había sido posible sin la edición de Ralph, so, Ralph, please, uh, I want to thank you for for our You're welcome. for opening the doors from the museum to our channel to our viewers. Thanks for And well, um, thank you very much again. Uh, estamos muy contentos. Y bueno, pues aquí está el museo del DCC. It is Doctor DCC. <laughs> También así lo pueden Bye. encontrar. Sus videos, uh, the, the YouTube channel is DCC Museum with Doctor DCC. DCC Museum is uh, and Doctor DCC is the YouTube channel. Yeah. Donde pueden ver los videos de dónde se reparan, cómo se reparan, cómo conseguirlos. Y este también uh, en eBay tiene una página este, donde pueden comprar cosas. Y bueno, pues mantengamos vivo el DCC. Uh, Ralph, once again, thank you very much for opening these doors. Y bueno, amigos, yo soy Ricardo Méndez. Nos vemos en otra edición de En Vinil. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. Ya saben, comentarios y todo lo demás. Este, compartan los videos. Y bueno, pues vean, estuvo en la cámara. Yo los dejo un poco apantallado con toda esta cosas, ahorita vamos a empezar a poner un poco de música y este pues nos vemos en otra edición de Envy. Hasta la próxima.